Welcome to Unpacking Armenian Studies and to this new limited series we're calling Ukraine, Armenia and War. This is a program of the U University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies. And it's our effort to bring together scholars, journalists, diplomats, politicians, to speak about all of the various global and regional aspects that this war in, on, around, for Ukraine has uh, brought to the forefront. I have spoken thus far with a representative of the Ukrainian diaspora, spoken with a journalist in Armenia who spoke about the information field and the political take in Armenia. And uh, we are also speaking with several diplomats. The diplomat, the ambassador from Armenia who represents uh, Armenia in Ukraine. And today we'll be speaking with the ambassador of Armenia who represents Armenia in Poland, the neighboring country. His Excellency Samben Magardician is a veteran diplomat. His most recent post, if I'm not wrong, he will correct me, was Lebanon, not a less complicated place, although certainly not in the midst of war as we are seeing in Ukraine and around Ukraine today. Ambassador Magrichan, thank you for taking the time to join us in this conversation. Thank you, Sophie, for inviting me. I couldn't imagine having this conversation without you because um, you also served for many years at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Vienna, and uh, you lived every day with the consequences of the fall of the Soviet Union and the resultant sovereign countries searching for sovereignty still. Is that an unfair way to play to put it? No, you are perfectly right. You know, you could even trace all these things that now we are witnessing and uh, unfortunately uh, witnessing all this tragedy. Uh, you can trace them back to the to the late 90s, you know, even, uh, even in the framework of the OSC, when, uh, uh, when the things were first going well, but uh, basically after the OSC summit of 1999 in Istanbul, when the sides uh, failed to agree, initially they agreed on the uh, adapted CFE treaty, but it was CFE never- is the yeah, conventional forces, forces in Europe. Europe. Uh huh. And then, uh, but it uh, was never ratified, uh, uh, particularly by the NATO member states, and never entered into force. And that military balance in Europe uh, since then started to change and to tilt in a in a in a very wrong way, you know, which eventually brought to uh, some new alignments and some new developments in, in the European security. And possibly some new divisions. And possibly some new divisions because all those processes are being accompanied by new alliances, you know, no, no, oh, and basically by the uh, further enlargement of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, which um, certainly and evidently uh, is, is having uh, geopolitical implications. You know, this is a really odd conversation to be having because it has seemed to me, uh, following this sometimes from close up, sometimes from afar, that there are some realities that are obvious. It is obvious that there are very different approaches to the presence of uh, Western European military presence in uh, certain parts of Europe, along Russia's border and elsewhere. The conversations now that are taking place in Poland, among the diplomatic community, uh, is there a better understanding of the nuances and the differences, or is it still very much these two levels of, yes, yes, everyone must decide for themselves, but then every now and then the West gets to decide for you? 
I think that currently we are living through a, a period of time, you know, when uh, no one is willing to reflect on uh, what was wrong or maybe why it went in in this way or not the other way. So, but probably time will come. You can hear some voices, but they are a very very small minority, and the predominant trend is to to consolidate the uh, Western uh, uh, unity and then to try to um, prevent uh, uh, what is being viewed as a kind of uh, encroachment from the other side uh, towards, the, towards the alliance and towards the uh, European or Western democracies. How how is Armenia navigating this? It's always been difficult for Armenia to navigate amongst the various global centers. Uh, it's hard enough when they get along, let alone when they don't. How are you navigating? You know, this is not new for us. <laughs> so, so you have been part uh, uh, of these processes. Well, uh, not not uh, too long ago. And you perfectly know that uh, um, we have always been trying to uh, kind of keep the balance between different centers of power, uh, be it regional or world powers. So, but um, at times uh, we had um, ups and downs, you know, quite naturally, because uh, when it comes uh, to tensions, uh, when the tensions are rising, between the competing different uh, camps, then uh, it, 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 it uh, immediately reflects on our uh, ability on, on our resources to maneuver between them. Uh, we have enjoyed uh, some periods of uh, relative you know, uh, calm and relative uh, um, atmosphere of cooperation uh, from which you also benefited a lot. And uh, that, that particularly relates to our relationship with NATO. But then when this thing started to move uh, towards this um, development, it, it certainly makes uh, our um, position more vulnerable. And also it invites uh, us to be much more circumspect and to, you know, to very often look uh, behind, you know, our shoulders to be careful not to act in a way that might harm our own interests at home. I think that uh, for many reasons, it is difficult for those in the West, both in seats of power as well as observers, whether it's, uh, you know, the diaspora or anybody else, to really um, uh, grasp Armenia's efforts, sometimes successful, sometimes not, to be a part of the West, uh, embracing Western values, embracing uh, the development of Western institutions, and at the same time, not in any way denying or dismissing its geographic realities and uh, historic alliances. Is, is that something that you have a hard time explaining to your colleagues? I sure have a hard time explaining that here because the impression is, you know, Armenia has chosen its sides and it is, uh, not only is it a strategic ally of Russia, but it is therefore necessarily not in any way engaged with the West. You know, it differs from one country uh, to, to another. I mean, those countries who, that are very security conscious, so to say, they, they always uh, understand, they understood our position and they appreciated uh, our uh, you know, determination and our political will to keep it that way, you know, not to uh, completely go um, one or the other way, but to try to be somewhere in, in between and trying to embrace the, um, the democratic values and trying to 
truly commit uh, to building democratic institutions, but also they uh, they see our uh, certain limits in terms of our own uh, security, and they uh, they always accept it as a, as a fact reality. of life. Oh, yeah, as a fact of life, you know, and the reality our security arrangements. So it's, um, let's talk about Poland specifically and and the neighboring countries. Uh, you're in Poland. Poland has become the frontline state now, uh, uh, watching this conflict, participating or not. Uh, where? What do you do? What is your day like? Yeah, it, it hasn't changed much, you know, in our daily routine, and you know, except of this uh, influx of refugees, and particularly the Armenians from Ukraine, from the neighboring countries. Uh, it, it certainly added a lot to, to our daily workload, but uh, we, we try to manage to cope with that. Um, but the same, but the, the Polish uh, uh, reality and the approaches to security uh, probably have more sharpened uh, in a way that they now accept that uh, these these security challenges are I mean coming close immediately to their own borders. And that that makes them uh, more more proactive in in diplomacy or even in in hard security, and trying to focus more on the strengthening of the eastern flank of NATO, or trying even to uh, act as a leader uh, on a regional uh, theater to uh, mobilize uh, the others' support and. Uh, kind of grouping or uh, uh, kind of a common action to cope with those challenges. Um, the humanitarian aspect of what you're doing now, uh, the influx of Armenians from Ukraine, uh, what is your role? Do you have a role? Does the embassy uh, get involved? What, what happens? Yeah, I have to admit that the uh, Polish authorities, uh, the central authorities, and then the regional ones um, have been sort of prepared to this kind of development uh, because there were reports in, in Polish media well uh, before the outbreak of uh, hostilities in, in Ukraine and the regional um, uh, structures were getting prepared to the influx of of the refugees. I don't know whether they have anticipated this huge number of refugees uh, moving so quickly across the border, but still uh, we can give a big credit to, to the Polish authorities that they are um, well organized in, in possible terms because um, they, um, they meet the, the people who cross the uh, Polish-Ukrainian border um, they provide them with temporary shelters, uh, with basic uh, you know, conditions, quite understandably. And then they provide uh, transportation, either by train or by buses, to different parts of Poland to accommodate them there. And, um, um, and they even hand to every, every refugee, every uh, person who crosses the a Ukrainian a Polish border a SIM card you know, to have their Polish numbers and not to be cut off the uh, communication and to be in touch with their family members or their you know, acquaintances somewhere else. Very thoughtful. Uh, what are the Armenians who are coming in seeing this as either temporary or permanent uh, placement, settlement, or are they, is this transit to Armenia? Uh, this is a very complex picture. You know, we have been um, from the, the day one. We have been uh, kind of you know following the, these processes. Uh, of course, we have extremely limited resources you know, as a small embassy, and we are cooperating uh, closely with the uh, some certain members of the Armenian community who are uh, willingly and generously offering their 
services to um, to meet, uh, to shelter, to uh, transport the Armenians who are um, uh, coming to Poland from uh, from uh, Ukraine. And um, we don't have the exact numbers, you know, how many Armenians have crossed the the border, but out of the overall number of uh, refugees or displaced persons who moved from Ukraine to um, to Poland is is now close to three million, you know? and, and proportionally proportionally it means that also the number of Armenians is high among them. Uh, so far, um, with the cooperation one with all of the. Armenian uh, organizations, uh, uh, Polish Armenian uh, Foundation, uh, providing them with the uh, uh, kind of you know, place to stay for a couple of days uh, until they decide what, what what was going to be their next uh, move, uh, whether they want to stay in Poland for some time, to move further to other European uh, countries. Uh, because again, the Armenian Armenian uh, population, so to say, which uh, now uh, find themselves in in Poland, uh, it's 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 a very complex picture. You know, they are mixed families. Uh, they, uh, some of them have Armenian passports. Uh, in in the same family, um, like the, the others, Ukrainian passports. Uh, some have, you know, residence permits. The others don't. Uh, some are uh, crossing the border without, you know, valid documents or uh, expired uh, docu validity documents. And we are trying also to assist them to recover their um, identity documents uh, uh, by by uh, issuing them new new. Armenian uh, documents. Uh, um, talk about the the Polish Armenian community. Is it as old as the Ukrainian Armenian community? The roots um, are there the same sorts of you know the old pre-Soviet from medieval times community, the Soviet emigres, and then the independent period emigres. No, oh, this is uh, the Armenian community currently, you know, in current uh, modern Poland is is very new. I mean, you can say very new, I mean, 30 years old, <laughs> because the Armenians started to move to uh, to Poland um, uh, en masse uh, at the beginning of 1990s because of the economic hardship, because of the uh, former ties uh, within the socialist uh, camp of, of countries and somehow they found themselves in Poland uh, at the beginning of 90s uh, there were since then uh, the majority of them are engaged in, in small trade uh, some some people have um, uh, kind of have been successful to advance but you cannot see them around you know this is a very very strange <laughs> community at some I even dare to say that there is no community because um, when you compare it with the our traditional communities, as you mentioned in your uh, opening introduction, uh, when I compare them with Lebanon, I mean there is no there is no uh, even no a single, no. yeah, uh, even a single you know point that you can make that comparison. I mean, let alone with the United States or other, other Armenian communities. And the, 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 there's an Armenian population very, very much scattered uh, in different parts of this large country. Uh, and there, there are no structures at all, you know, that, that, that can unite them. Yeah? And yeah. yet you said that to the extent that there are any organizations, they're being very welcoming and helping. Yeah, but, but I mentioned only this organization, and uh, we have been cooperating with that particular organization uh, for, for some time already, and, and they are very active in cultural field. We organize the joint events. And is this is this like the structures in other East European former Soviet bloc countries, where the government actually offers financial support and recognition to ethnic minority communities? 
you know, it's again, I mean, it's, it's very different, you know, because uh, there is no financial support to... to well, it's not like Hungary and other places. Well, no, not like Hungary, yes. Of course, these uh, cultural organizations might apply and get uh, kind of occasional uh, financing from the government. Um, uh, but Armenians, of course, Armenians are recognized as official national minority in Poland, but this is uh, predominantly is represented by the very old historic community, which uh, has a very, very small kind of group of people uh, remaining uh, currently. And uh, because that historic community, uh, Armenian community, which was prospering, so to say, in the Middle Ages, uh, in the in the western part of Ukraine, current Ukraine, in the area of Lvov and Ivano-Frankivsk, um, they are almost completely assimilated. Yeah. Uh, but they still have uh, a small group of them still have the, you know the self-identification of being of. Armenian origin. They also have a sort of organization culture which deals with the Armenian heritage, cultural and religious heritage in Poland, and also looking to identify and reveal uh, Polish um, uh, politicians, military, uh, or other civil servants of Armenian origin that have been in service with the Polish government, Polish society. The, so this, this is a complex picture, you know, yeah. but uh, as, as, uh, there is no, of course, we have only recently, we have registered 10 years ago, the Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, but we don't have uh, an Armenian church as, as per se. A structure. Structure, yes. As, uh, because the, uh, the Holy Father that has been sent here to Poland, He's, he's having his masses and liturgies in Polish churches, which they... Interesting, so different from the other East European communities. Um, yes. Let's ask the, let me ask the obvious question. The 2020 war, Azerbaijan, Armenia-Azerbaijan relations, that colors and impacts so much of Armenia's bilateral relationships with other countries. Uh, does it impact your work in Poland, generally and especially today? You know, the, the Polish, I mean, my, my counterparts, you know, my, uh, let's say, I mean, in different Polish institutions, but predominantly in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are very uh, receptive, you know, um, to our approaches, to our, uh, you know, kind of requests. Uh, um, but um, but Poland, as, as, as kind of a general line and general rule, tries to keep kind of you know neutrality uh, in this issue, and and, uh, and they insist all the time, you know, that uh, which which uh, uh, we are fine with that. Uh, that's their uh, their decision, and no no one can interfere with that. That uh, they have very good relations both with Armenia and with Azerbaijan. And there was much hope that while um, in the chairmanship of the OEC for 2022, uh, they could play a role, but I mean, but the, the, the OEC uh, itself is, is very, very kind of <laughs> weak and very, very uh, devoid of the functional mechanism or, uh, influence uh, to make a change. I think one thing should be said in that context, even those who are students of international politics uh, may not follow that closely. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, unlike other organizations like the Council of Europe or the UN, um, every member country has veto power. It operates by consensus, which means that things Decisions are difficult to accept and pass. Is that fair? And yeah, that that, that, that gives a, 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 a small council like Armenia a powerful tool, you know. But the same tool 
is uh, also in the hands uh, uh, to, to, so, to say so in, in the hands of our adversaries. And, and I mean, it is being, being uh, very, very, very uh, skillfully misused and, and to block the cooperation for one country, like in the case of Armenia with the organization and, uh, and also it makes uh, eventually the whole organization ineffective yes. well that's as good a place as any to stop i think unless there is something you wanted to mention that i have not asked um well, i think uh, but i still believe in, in the power of diplomacy you know? so uh, i think uh, uh, when all this was brewing and then uh, it came to the point of uh, eventual explosion on, on February 24th, just in the run-up of, of, to this uh, you know, open warfare, uh, I was still uh, hoping that diplomacy will prevail, you know, that, the, uh, that the sides uh, could come to sort of compromise and could uh, kind of uh, go back from their maximalistic approaches and continue to talk. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but as you perfectly know, diplomacy never sleeps. Even the warring parties are meeting and trying to, to kind of to talk to each other, which is the best way uh, to, to find the end to this devastating and uh, kind of destructive uh, wars that's now currently is, is, is going there. Well, from, from your lips to God's ears, because we're going to need the same diplomacy in the Caucasus still. I mean, these, this... Uh, um... yeah, in, in that terms, you know, in terms of the Caucasus and our own, you know, problems and our on security challenges, uh, I have to admit that we feel kind of, you know, less attention to our uh, situation and because uh, everyone nowadays is focused on, on Ukraine and uh, uh, sort of, I mean, they, they don't see other things are happening and which is extremely uh, worrying and extremely dangerous that um, might, um, might that they might overlook um, yet another uh, uh, crisis to blow. Yes, the crisis uh, in, in Caucasus continues. The Russian peacekeepers in Ladapov are distracted. I don't know if that's the right word. And uh, the violence against the Armenians of Ladapov continues. So uh, the impact of this war in and around Ukraine has huge reach around the world. Thank you for helping us try to understand parts of it. Ambassador Samran Magardichian in Warsaw. Thank you, sir. And thank you to all of you who are following this mini series. We are calling Ukraine, Armenia and War. There will be many more episodes to come about the various aspects, particularly economic and regional, including the view from Iran and uh, many of the global questions that are being asked in this context. This is a project of the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies, Unpacking Armenian Studies, Ukraine, Armenia, and War. I'm Salpi Ghazarian. Thank you for following us. You've been listening to Unpacking Armenian Studies, a podcast series on the Institute of Armenian Studies channel. This episode has been produced by Sadin Habeshian. Music by Josue Gonzalez. For more from the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, go to the Institute's YouTube channel to hear dozens of talks by scholars from all over the world. You can reach the Institute at armenian at usc.edu and follow the Institute on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast has been recorded at the University of Southern California Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. Thank you.